For the rest of us, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1 together. Ephesians chapter 1. We just spent three weeks in verses uh, 3 through 14, rather, which is the longest sentence in the Bible. In the original Greek, it's one long sentence, 202 words. Now we come to this passage in verses 15 through 23, which is another long sentence. Not quite as long. We're just spending one week on this. uh, But it's another long sentence uh, in the original Greek. So uh, almost all of Ephesians chapter 1 is simply two sentences. Uh, So it really shows the point that Paul is trying to emphasize here. Paul's just uh, really can't even handle himself. He's not even using proper grammar. He's just simply writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the glory of Christ and His blessings toward His people. And that's what we see here this morning. This is where we're going to dive in. Before we do, let's pray together. Father, would You enlighten our hearts? Give us Your vision. Help us to see the, the beauty of King Jesus through this. Lord, I pray that we would be able to say, not just with our mouths, but with our lives, with our word, with our hearts, that we believe in God our Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that these truths deep into our soul. Give us a vision of what this working power in us is. Your power to empower Your people. Help us to see how wonderful and beautiful You are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The church I grew up in, we had an electrician. Uh, I didn't know him super well, but uh, he asked me one summer, I think it was the summer between my junior and senior year, maybe sophomore and junior year, I don't remember, uh, to apprentice with him, which is kind of funny. If you know me for any, any amount of time, you know I am not very good with anything having to do with tools, much less being an electrician. He obviously didn't know me very well. Uh, But nonetheless, he asked me to apprentice with him. Uh, But he wasn't just any electrician. This is why it's important to ask questions. Uh, The more I got to discuss with him what his job entailed, the more I realized uh, what he actually did. You know those uh, huge cell phone towers that are anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 feet in the air? His job was to climb those towers and to change out the light bulbs. Uh, And so he asks me to apprentice with him, and that may have been the shortest Uh, time I've ever thought about a job offer. Uh, Of course, I was trying to be spiritual about it, so I said, well, let me pray about it. No. And so, it was a a real quick answer. I, nonetheless, never, never did that. Uh, But think about that little light bulb. I've got a light bulb here. I asked my wife to bring that. Uh, I brought a little light bulb. Think about this little light bulb powering those towers, giving out all that light. And uh, not just those towers. Uh, You can see many other towers, such as of the Cutler Towers. And though I've often talked about the negative impacts of Edison's invention, right? Edison didn't uh, like sleep. He only slept a couple hours a night. He thought we should be more productive. I've talked about how uh, the, after the invention of the light bulb, uh, our uh, average amount of sleep has almost been cut in half. And some of the other negative aspects, while at the same time, there are many positive aspects of the light bulb. I'm thankful that you can go to an ER at 2 in the morning if you need it, and they can see what they're doing. If you have to have emergency surgery, I don't want a guy holding a torch over, over my body, right? There, there are some, some good, positive implications of the light bulb. And our society has been completely changed, including in many positive ways, because of the power of this little invention, the power that something like a light bulb gives off. And that's really where... Not a light bulb, but the power piece where Paul goes off with this prayer. He begins to focus on power. So when we think about uh, something powerful like a light bulb, uh, we should hopefully, as gospel people, begin to think about where all ultimate power comes from, our ultimate source of power. And in this text, Paul records for us a prayer for power, focus of, on the power of Christ in us, for us, and over us. Many Christians 
maybe even most Christians, don't sense this power over their lives. I would argue most Christians, especially in our current cultural context, don't this kind of power in their lives. Maybe you don't. Maybe, and I, again, I don't know all of your stories. Maybe coming to church to you, just some religious motivation. Maybe your day, it doesn't shape or affect your day-by-day lives. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe you sense this power. But this is where Paul really prays, and I, I hope we can grasp this. Because right? many people, many believers believe this power. They may read these things and believe it with a head knowledge, but have a hard time seeing it played out in their lives, or have a hard time feeling it. And this is not just some um, cute religious motto that we put on a coffee mug. This is God's living word displaying the power of Jesus to us. And, and I'm not talking about emotionalism, right? When we talk about feeling this kind of power, we don't, I know, I know where many minds go, right? We kind of tend to go towards uh, the, the ultimate extreme of that. I'm not talking about emotionalism, though emotions are important. I'm not talking about experientialism, but a deep sense of the power of God at work in our hearts and a deep love for Christ's power over our lives. So my question to you today is, are you sensing that power in your own life? Are we as a church sensing that power, walking by that power, the same power that resurrected Christ that we're going to see here in a minute? Or are we living by our own power, our own authority? Whose authority and whose power do we live by? What powers us? Are we like a cell phone tower without a light bulb? Do we have some kind of source of power? With that, let's dive into the text. Verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Go back to verse 15. Paul's connecting this when he says, for this reason, he's connecting this with that long sentence of verse 3-14. through 14. And remember, we focused on three primary aspects, though we probably could have spent a year in that one sentence, that one passage, we focus on three primary aspects of it. The loving adoption, the loving adoption of Christ. Remember, in love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself. The cosmic redemption, the fact that Christ is redeeming, uniting all things in heaven and things on earth. And the guaranteed inheritance, the inheritance of the saints that you and I, if we're following Christ, if we're in Christ, have because of Him, and it's guaranteed through His Spirit. These are all part of the blessings that Paul has already hit on. And now, after he's just expounded these glorious blessings that we, as His people, if you're in Christ, have in Christ, he prays this prayer for power over the Ephesian church. Now, now that's really interesting. Think about how Paul is, is flowing with this text. He's already said, these things are yours in Christ. If you are in Christ, these things are yours. The loving adoption the cosmic redemption, the guaranteed inheritance. But then he moves to prayer. It's kind of interesting that that Paul does that. If those things are yours, why do we need to pray about those things? If I'm already married to my wife, why do I need to pray about marrying my wife? Or maybe it's because these blessings are more than just some kind of head knowledge. Paul's wanting to get at something deeper than that. He's going to say that, especially in verse 18 when he says, having the the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know 
And then he says three things. What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? That third one is the one we're focusing on today. I think we've already hit on the hope to which Christ has called us and the riches of his glorious inheritance. But the focus here in the rest of that passage is really on power. And these blessings should cause us to lean into Christ's power more. So in other words, the I pray about falling in love, following in that marriage with her, the more and the more that I spend time with her, the more that I remind myself of the goodness of marriage with her, the more I will truly act as a husband. It's called to act. Likewise, though these things are ours in Christ, the loving adoption, the cosmic redemption, the glorious guaranteed inheritance, the more that we fix our eyes on Christ, the giver of those things, the more that we will walk and act and live as His children. We've talked about that over and over and over again. We are not changed and shaped as you're beat over the head saying, you just have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. That's not how the human heart is changed. I can change behavior like that. You can change your own behavior like that at times. But your heart, your desires will never be changed and shaped that way. Our heart is only shaped by the glory of Christ in the Gospel. As He opens up our eyes to Him. And so Paul prays this prayer and he begins, here's really the first point where he begins, thanksgiving for this prayer. Point number one, this is the, the thank for this power, rather. Look again at verse 15 and 16. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. This is the thanksgiving Thanksgiving peace. He's thanking God for this power. Notice what he's giving thanks for, by the way. When he says, I give thanks for you, there's two things that Paul mentions prior to that in verse 15. He says, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. So here he's saying, because of your faith in Jesus, because of your your love towards others, I am thanking God for this power that he has done in you. Isn't that interesting? Why would he... Thank God for faith and love. I think if we have a man-centered view of Christianity, we think that you and I are producing faith and love in ourselves. The Gospel is, and the book of Ephesians especially hits on this, that it's God who has to produce faith and love in our own hearts. Which is why, by the way, every time that you see this kind of a prayer in the epistles, Paul is always thanking God. He says this over and over and over again. I thank God for your faith. I thank God for your love. He's not thanking the Ephesian believers. This is a prayer. Thank God for the faith and the love toward all the saints. This is that same power that that gives believers faith and love. And he's thanking God for that. I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers. And so we have to ask the question, where do faith and love come from? From God. We've already established, I know this is a a hard topic to grasp, but we've already established like verse 4, back in Ephesians 1 verse 4, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, verse 5, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. We establish that this doesn't take away our responsibility to trust in Christ. But it does mean that when we trust in Christ, we know that God has already been working in our hearts. Salvation is initiated by God. That's not something to, to fight against. That's something to simply worship God for. I have no idea why He chose me, why He rescued me out of darkness and death. There's nothing in me deserving of that. But I can praise Him and worship Him for that because that's a reality. That faith and that love comes from God. It flows out of God. And this is that power. It's the power of the Gospel. We've, we've talked about this verse a lot, but Romans 1.16 I think says it so well. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Have you ever thought when, when sharing the Gospel or talking about the Gospel or reading the Gospel that that's actually the power the, the power of someone proclaiming is not 
one's charisma or how loud and booming the but rather in the gospel itself. The fact that Jesus died and rose again, that's the actual power that and changes hearts. And this is the very power that Paul is giving thanksgiving for. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So point number one, this is the thanksgiving for this power. We should thank God for that working power in us. If you are following Jesus today, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, that should be a daily thanksgiving to God. Jesus, thank you that you have rescued me. Thank you that you have given me faith and you have given me love for all the saints. This is a sentence of worship, just like verses 3 to 14 was. Paul is worshiping. He can't help but worship as he's penning these words. In verse 17, this is what he's remembering them. Not only is he giving thanks, but here's point two, he's also giving a petition for this power. So this is where uh, kind of the dichotomy, or what seems like a dichotomy in the Christian walk. We've talked about this before, uh, the already not yet concept. Like you and I are already in Christ. We are already sanctified before the Father. We have this positional sanctification. You and I, uh, as God looks on us, he, we cannot be any more or less holy in His sight because Christ, the ultimate Holy One, has covered us. So we are positionally perfectly sanctified. But practically, you and I, you could spend five minutes with me and realize I am not completely sanctified. So practically, as we're walking on this earth from one of the perspectives, we are still growing in that sanctification. That's the already, not yet. We're already sanctified. We're not yet sanctified. The, the kingdom of God has already come. It has not yet fully been realized. Right? Go on and on about this. And this is the same thing here. This is what Paul is doing in this prayer. He's saying, I give thanks for that power that has given you that faith and that love, but I'm also asking that God would continue to give you that power. Verse 17, he's petitioning for this power. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. He's asking that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation of knowledge in Him. Now remember, he's writing this to Christians. So yes, we pray for unbelievers, on Sunday nights during our prayer meetings, not tonight, we won't be here, but uh, we pray for unbelievers, that God would open up their eyes, that God would give them His Spirit. But Paul here is not focused on unbelievers, but rather believers. He's focused on the church. Remember, he's writing this to the church in Ephesus, and yet, he prays, give them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Him. I think Paul realizes something that we often forget. We constantly need God's power. We don't trust in Jesus, trust in the gospel, and then become less dependent on him. I think a lot of times I, I kind of grew up viewing that, like the gospels were the A, and then the gospel was the ABC, and, and then I kind of moved past that and moved on to, to better and more mature things. No, the way that we mature, the Bible absolutely calls us to spiritual maturity, but it says the way that we mature is actually the gospel. It's actually looking at the revelation of the glory of Christ through the gospel, through his work what he's already done and what he's going to do. And where he is now. This is where Paul's going to go here in a minute. Towards the end of this, he takes it, the focus. takes the focus and puts it on Jesus. We do this all the time. We do the opposite all the time, don't we? In our Bible reading, we, we tend to kind of take the focus off of Jesus and we ask questions like, how does this apply to me? Again, not that that's a bad thing. You and I are called to obedience, absolutely. But if we're doing that without a focus on Christ, the one to whom all of the Bible points, we're, we're missing the actual point. Same with the sermon. You and I aren't the hero of this sermon. You and I aren't the hero of this Bible. You and I aren't the hero of this life. Christ is. And He gets all the glory. All the power. And because of his love, he invites you and I to be in that, to share in that. 
It's the story of David and Goliath all over again. This is such a foundational story. That's, I think it's the perfect example because I grew up. Here. And that's not at all what that passage is about. Christ is the better David. Christ stands in our place. He defeats the Goliath of Satan, sin, and death for us. And you and I, the Israelites, remember the scared Israelites? They're like, ah, I'm not fighting Goliath. They got to share in his victory. Their, their whole, when David killed Goliath, when he hit him, the, the, the whole posture, We have that power. That is power, by the way. They saw the power. When we see the power of Christ who has defeated our enemies. It will absolutely motivate us for motivation for the rest of life. And this is what Paul is petitioning to. He's saying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. You want wisdom? Pray for it. Ask to give you that. You want revelation in the knowledge of Christ? Ask for it. Pray Verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. What a beautiful phrase. When someone asks you how you come to know Christ, and I'm guilty of this as anyone, how often do we start with, well, I? What if we started with, well, God enlightened the eyes of my heart. He woke me up out of my deadness to see how great and beautiful and glorious He is. And then I went and did this. Verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? Look at that word, know. Right? He's already said, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. So why have our hearts been enlightened by God? So that we would know what is the hope and the riches and the immeasurable greatness of His power. This no here uh, really means a proper, I like the way Charles Hodge, one commentator, says it. He says it's a proper appreciation. No, it's not just a, oh yeah, I know something. I know some kind of fact about it. power. But it's a proper appreciation for it. So, so take our example last week. Remember when we talked about the glorious, or rather the guaranteed inheritance? Imagine you inherited... I don't know, whatever, whatever sounds like a big number to you, $100 million. At this point, about $1,000 sounds big to me. But uh, $100 million that you inherit. How would we respond? What would be a proper response? A proper re- response is not, oh, yeah, okay, I know that's true, thanks. That would be a very improper response. And yet we've been given an inheritance much greater than $100 million or $100 billion or $100 trillion, whatever an, any dollar amount you want to put on it. And how often do we just say, yeah, I know that. I know that already. I know the gospel. I know of God's love for me. Okay. It's different just knowing something with a head knowledge and really treasuring it in our hearts. You, as a, I'm saying you because I'm not one, but you as a Patriots fan, right? Many of you as Patriots fans know the Patriots. You know of the Patriots. You watch their games. But... You know it very differently than Tom Brady. Tom Brady's experienced. I know he's not with them anymore, so it's kind of a sore subject, and I apologize. Sorry, Christina. But Tom Brady knows the Patriots in a deeper, more intimate level than anyone in here. Because he's experienced that. He's been a part of that team. And so it's one thing to know Christ and to know these truths with a head knowledge. It's another thing to actually experience it, to be a part of of what Christ is doing, this kind of power. And God wants you to have assurance, by the way. This is why He says to know. He wants you to know the hope to which He has called you. He doesn't want us saying, I was like, well, I hope I make I don't know how many times I've heard that, and I know I'm a young pastor, I hear that all the time, but I've been a part of a lot more than any pastor my age should be a part of. And I don't know how many times I've heard that phrase. Well, I hope they made it. Or I hope I make it. That's that's not. 
hope is talking about. Christ wants us to have this assurance. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. This is much different than just a head knowledge. I mean, the book of James says that even the demons believe and shudder. They know. The demons know that Jesus resurrected from the dead. I mean, think of the story of uh, the sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19. Remember, remember that story which actually happened in Ephesus? Ephesus was kind of, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, was kind of this uh, center of dark arts and magic. And, and so you had a lot of those types of things going on. Uh, and Paul was walking through Ephesus and Paul was healing people and casting out do- demons and doing all these great things. And then you had these seven sons of this priest named Sceva who tried to go out and to uh, cast out a demon. And this is what that demon says to them in verse 15 of Acts chapter 19. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? Did you catch that first phrase he says, Jesus I know? So you're saying, wait, is that, Je- is that what Paul's talking about here? Does that demon believe? Does he know Jesus? No. He, doesn't, he knows with a head knowledge, but he doesn't love it. He's not getting to experience the power of God in his life. He's going to be eternally separated from God. The demons shudder when they see Jesus. So this isn't talking about demon belief. Any of us that say, well, yeah, I know these things are true, that's, just, that's demon belief. Paul's talking about something deeper here. Do we have a demon knowledge or a true heart knowledge that we've experienced this hope to which he has called you? Again, which we talked about already in the loving adoption, the cosmic redemption, the guaranteed inheritance. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Again, we've talked about. But then verse 19, and this is where Paul goes with the rest of this passage. He connects verse 19 with what he's about to say in verses 20 and on. Verse 19, and this is what he wants us to know. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? There's a lot of workings and powers and mights that appear in uh, this passage. Let's kind of break it apart. At first, he says, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Concept of modern technology. Now, it's not perfect. No, but we have some kind of measurements, rough measurements, albeit, but rough measurements for stars and galaxies, right? So you can see how many billions of stars and galaxies are around. We have some kind of really no. Paul's saying it's something even more than that. It's immeasurable. No sense or concept of measuring the greatness of God's power. Because that's God who spoke those and stars into existence. He spoke and those things were there. What is the immeasurable power of his greatness? This power, not contained, not measured. That word power there, the Greek word is dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. There's a lot of power. If you've ever seen a dynamite explosion, there's a lot of power that goes into that. A lot of our society was built on dynamite. We built railroads and and roads. There's a lot of power that goes into that. And this is where, again, we get the word dynamite. This is where Paul goes with this. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power, this explosive greatness, this power toward us who believe? What does God do with that power? He shows it to us, his people who believe, according to the working of his great might. Are we a part of that? Do we experience that? I actually like the, the way that the, the NASB says this. The, the ESV kind of sums it up to uh, make it a uh, in English because there's a lot that goes on. But the NASB leaves it as it is. And it makes bad English, but it makes a really good 19 in the New American Standard says it like this. What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. You see the repetition there? The working of the strength of his... But it's actually three different words really beginning to hit at how great and how deep this is. John Calvin says it like this. When he talks... uh, Paul really goes in reverse order. So when Paul says, back in verse 19, 
Uh, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. It's really backwards. If we flip these, Calvin says it like this. He says the first one, might, is the root. God's might is the root from which his power flows. The second, his strength, is the tree. That's what you and I see. We don't see God's might. We do see his strength shown to us. If you're working out with somebody who's, who's strong, you're not seeing how mighty they are, but you are seeing what is the outworking of that, their strength. That's the tree. And the third is the fruit, is what Calvin says. That's the working. So when he says, what is the, or the, rather, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, we're not seeing his might. We do see his strength. And how do we see the strength? Through his working in our lives. That's the fruit. As we see God working in our lives, we see that strength. And again, it's one thing to know it with a head knowledge. It's a completely different thing to actually taste it, to actually experience it. I love the way Jonathan Edwards says this, the 18th century Massachusetts pastor. He said it like this. There's a difference between having an opinion that God is holy and gracious and having a sense of the loveliness and beauty of that holiness and grace. There is a difference between having a rational judgment that honey is sweet and having a sense of its sweetness. A man may have not how honey tastes, but a man can't have the unless he has an idea of the taste of honey in his mind. So there is a difference between believing that a person is beautiful and having a sense of his I can tell you that honey is sweet, but you'll never actually know with an experiential knowledge until you actually taste of that honey. That's what Jonathan Edwards is saying here. This is the kind of knowledge he's talking about. Do we see that power of God working in us? And he's asking, Lord, I pray that you would work this way in your people. So the first thing we see is his thanksgiving for this power. Then we see the petition for this power. Now in verse 20, Paul kind of shifts gears. Notice how Paul does this often. You're going to see this in Ephesians. He always is running back to Jesus. Barely can get a, a full thought out about what we are called to do, as in as that is, without. Or this is the display of the power. So we saw the thanksgiving for this power. We saw the petition for this power, and now he begins to show the display of this power. Verse twenty. That he worked, so all those different powers, those words for powers that we saw, he says this in verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Again, this is a continuation of verse 19, that immeasurable greatness of his power. This is the display of that. He says he raised Christ. Now you would expect, if I was was going to explain the power of God, maybe if you were going to explain the power of God, I think I would often go to his creation. Would we not? When we talked about trillions of stars and galaxies that God has spoken into existence, or you look out of the ocean, and see that, or the trees, or just life, the way that life works, we know there's no way that that could just happen by chance. Someone spoke that into existence. And, and the Old Testament often goes to that. But notice what Paul does here. He doesn't go to creation. It's kind of interesting. Though he could have, he goes right to the power of the resurrection and the current power of Christ. It's an even greater power, by the way. As great as God's creation was, the power of God's new creation, what he's doing in the church, what he's doing in the lives and hearts of people is is even greater. And so Paul says that he worked in Christ, not when he created the world, but when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Christ has been raised. He's been resurrected. That's the power, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead after three days lives in us. And he has seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. The Bible is a good way to read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Anytime you see that, especially in the Psalms, 
at the right hand of God, or in Isaiah at the right hand of God. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the one seated at the right hand. So we see in Psalm 16:11 that at God's right hand are pleasure forevermore. Who's sitting at God's right hand? Jesus. Jesus is the one who is the ultimate pleasure forevermore. Pleasure light in Christ. He's the one who's been seated. He's the one with all authority and power. He said that. Some of his life, 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Christ has that power. And Paul is describing that. Verse 20 again. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. There is no single being human or demonic or angelic that has any power or authority over Jesus. Christian, we live in a time where power has been since the fall, but, but I think we just now more. Power and authority is this thing that's just lifted up and we all have to climb to it and get to it. And there's a, a few powerful people or companies that we see control a lot of things, do we not? We see this this relentless grab for power. I think it's the reason why so many people have become disillusioned with politics in our day and age. It's this relentless grasp for power and authority for a few years. Like a bunch of blades of grass trying to see which blade can be the tallest blade of grass. And soon they'll be chopped away and blown away in the wind. Christ has all authority. No one can dethrone him. Whoever's in the White House, they're going to fade away. Who's ever the king of whatever country, the president of Russia, whatever kind of power and authority you want to say, will pass, will fade. Christ will not. And no one is above him. He's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And remember, this is also a very spiritual book. Paul is hitting at some of the spiritual nature, the spiritual warfare that goes on within the church. We're going to see that. As Ephesus was a very spiritual, right? They focused on magic and dark arts, and they knew that well. And so Paul was really hitting at that. There's no single demonic being. Does it look like Satan's running rampant right now? Many of us, from our experience, would probably say yes. But he has no, not a lick of authority over Christ. Christ holds Satan on a leash. Satan has already been crushed. And one day he'll ultimately be vanquished. Christian, we have nothing to fret or to fear because Christ has all authority and all rule and all power and all dominion. And He has every name that is named. He has the name that's of all else. Let's go back to the Patriots example. Let's say you were to go to Gillette Stadium. It's one thing to go to the Gillette Stadium as a fan and walk and be there. It would be another thing to go to Gillette Stadium as Bob Kraft's guest. Would it not? You get to fly out on that helicopter and fly out onto the field and, hey, because of your own name, you would Because, at least when it comes to Patriots games, his name is of all the other names there. Christ's name is the name that is above every other name. History. Right? His empire is still moving on. Here we are 2,000 years later after Jesus has come to this earth. None of us remember Caesar. When I think of Caesar, I think of some cheap $5 pizza. The Roman Empire is gone. But Christ's empire still continues on. With and billions who have gone before us, by the way. Christ's empire marches on, the gates of hell will not overcome. Christ's empire will continue on because He has all authority and power and dominion. And He has the name that is above every name. Christ is not a means to an end. Christian, if you're in here, I plead with you. If you're using Jesus as some kind of means to an end, like if I trust Jesus, then He'll make my life better. If I trust Jesus, then He'll give me what I really want, a friend or a girlfriend or, or a money or a good job or a good career. None of those things are true. Christ is the end Himself. And He'll use whatever means necessary to get you to see His beauty. Think of the story of Job. It's, it's just the, the idyllic 
view of suffering. Job goes through the suffering and through this pain. He had it all. He had riches and he lost ten kids, all his wealth, and even his wife was telling him to curse God and die. And at the end of that, after God comes and rebukes him and shows him what he was doing in his life, Job says, I think one of the most profound statements about this very thing, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened. In Job 42.5, he says, I used to know you, talking to God, I used to know you by the hearing of the ear. In other words, I knew you, like these demons knew you, I knew you by the hearing of the ear. But now the eye of my heart sees you. Through suffering, Job actually loved God more. He saw who God really was. Those who suffer with Jesus the most see him as the sweetest. Because he has all authority and power and dominion. They know no one can supplant him. He is the name that is above every name. He is the supreme display of this power that we are talking about. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come. There's an age coming that Christ is bringing as the new heaven and the new earth come down. And he has all authority and power there too. No one's going to supplant that. That will go on forever and ever and ever. Verse 22, And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Do you notice the the picture there? All things are under Jesus' feet. So just think of him on his throne and all things are under his feet. In other words, he has that authority. But there's something that's not necessarily described as under his feet, but rather as a part of him. And that is, someone say it, search of the sea ends with an urch. Church. The church. He put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. There's not one thing not under Jesus' feet, but the only thing that's described as Jesus' body is actually the church. Because Jesus is the head of the church. Have you ever seen an, a headless animal? Have you ever been a part of like a chicken killing when they chop? Grew up in a city, so I didn't see a lot of this. But I remember uh, in, in school one time going to our principal's house, to uh, his farm, to watch him chop off a chicken. That was our, that was our field trip, by the way. This is a, uh, we, went, we went, probably could not do that today. We went to his house. He was going to show us, demonstrate for us how you chop a chicken's head off. And, uh, he was going to cook us up a chicken pot pie or something like that. And uh, he was, he was an, not, not trying to be mean. He was an older gentleman, kind of had a shaky hand. And even as a youngin, I knew that axe head that he's using is not going to do the job. And he goes to begin to act as kind of great for lunch. But he begins to hack, and the chicken's head about halfway off. And, you know, it's a white chicken. So blood's just down. It's running around, and everyone's trying to chase. Girls are throwing up, and the guys are like, yeah! And we're chasing that, that chicken. And finally, we get it, and, and he chops the rest of it off, and it runs around for another few seconds and then plops over. It doesn't live very long without its head. As amusing as that was for me, I'm sure, if you ask the girls, it was terrifying and traumatic. But as amusing as that was for me, it's, it's a picture that stuck in my head. Like that, that chicken could only live so long without its head. There was some activity going on for sure. If its head was flopping around. But it didn't last very long. And the church is the same way. One of my, one of my concerns as a pastor, and I want to make sure we're guarding against this, is that we do not confuse productivity with life. That chicken had some kind of productivity. It was doing some movement, but it, was, it had no life in it. And if we are not attached to the head, to Christ, the one who is our source of life, the one who is our source of power, but we're just doing activity for the sake of activity, we'll be like that chicken running around with its head cut off for a little bit until we plop over and die. That's true of us personally as followers of Jesus, but also as a church. Are we connecting to the head? To Christ, the source of power. He's the one who has all things under his feet, and he's the one who is the head over all things to the church, which is his body. And only the church, not all of creation, is Christ's body. Therefore, we should see the church as essential. And I'm not just talking about this, I'm not talking about the building. 
talking about us as the people of God as we gather on Sundays, Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, Friday mornings, Tuesday afternoons, whenever else we gather. And as we go out, as we're the church gathered and was, we're the, uh, the church sent, as we go out into this community, are you individually seeing yourself as connected to God, the source of all power? He's the s- display of this power. Benefits of flow from, uh, from the object of faith. We've talked that, about that before. We only receive the benefits of faith as so much as we focus on the object of faith, which is Jesus. So does our power flow from the supreme owner of this power. So again, I ask the question, are you experiencing this power in your own life? Power to say no to sin. That's not in your own strength. That's through the gospel. Jesus shed his precious blood to give you his spirit so that you could say no to sin and walk in holiness. Jesus shed his precious blood so that you could follow him obediently into the world to preach the gospel. We're not called to just huddle up here. We're called to go out with power and authority in the world. How do we, as a church, and remember Paul's writing this to a church, succeed in mission and worship only as far as we trust the power of Christ in us? The true purpose of the church must be to enjoy Christ, trust in His power, and to help other people see His supremacy. That's the, that's the ultimate goal of the church. The ultimate goal of the church is not just to put on events or reach kids or give. Those are all important things, but those are all secondary to seeing the supremacy and the centrality of Jesus. That's the ultimate thing. If we gather and we miss that, we're missing it all. Christ is supreme. If Christ truly is it, the one with all power and all authority, and with the name that is above all names, then our gatherings here at the corner of Broadway and Court Street should or else we are wasting our time. And if our lives as the church in the community aren't doing that, aren't displaying the greatness of Jesus, we will be wasting our time. Are we reflecting that He's the one with all power and authority? Here's an essential question to ask yourself. Do you live life as if you have supreme power working in you? Or do we see ourselves as victims? Now, I I know, and I don't want to be cold-hearted, and I know many of you have had really difficult things happen to you in your life. And you're not to blame when you're a victim. But I think as Christians, sometimes we take on that mentality. Like, the whole world is against us. Of course it is. Jesus told us it was going to be 2,000 years ago. But no one else in the world has any kind of power working in them. In fact, they're dead. We're going to see this next week in Ephesians chapter 2, that those without Christ are actually dead, walking zombies. You and I are alive, having the, the very power of God breathed into our lives. So how can we not... One, walk in obedience to Jesus. And two, go out and proclaim Jesus. How could we not tell, like other beggars who have discovered where food is, tell other beggars where the food is? Jesus is it. Christ is it. So do we live our lives as if the supreme, powerful being in all the universe, Jesus, is displaying His power to you and through you? Is that how we live our lives, Christian? It should be. Christ is worthy of it. He's the one with all authority and power. Let me read the last verse of the the great modern hymn, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And we'll pray together. Verse 4 says this, Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain Him. Praise the Lord, He is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance. Christ's resurrection is just a foretaste of what will happen to us. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected as we will be when He comes. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your power displayed to us in Christ. That we have the supreme power.
God, I want to thank you for the power that is ours, for our faith in you, Jesus, and our love toward the saints. And Lord, I also want to petition that you would, as Paul prayed here, enlighten the eyes of our hearts, that we would know, not just with a head knowledge, but with a, a deep love, a heart knowledge, what is the hope to which you have called us? What are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of your power towards who believe? And I fix our eyes on you, Jesus, the King, our Redeemer, the one who, as verse 27, 21 rather, tells us, power and dominion, the one who has the name that is above every name. And the one who has all things under his feet. And the one who is the Machias Valley Baptist Church would be a church solely fixated on you. And I pray that the only reason why we do anything, any kind of activity that we do, is because we want to display the supremacy of you, Jesus. We want to display your power to a world that is so powerless. Your living power in us to a world that is dead could not make their hearts alive. Would you help us, Jesus, to walk in obedience to you? To this world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together.